so thank you guys all, uh, all for coming. Um, uh, this is kind of a continuation of uh, what has started to be a tradition at OHBM, which is uh, at some point early in the meeting, a question gets asked um, uh, by a couple of people, and then at some point I decide or someone else decides that it would be great to get people talking about this in a conversation. And so this is very much a conversation. Um, and so uh, this is kind of called like low dimensional representations in cognitive and systems neuroscience, but it could equally be called what, what even is a gradient or please not another Twitter argument about uh, manifolds. Um, but uh, kind of importantly, this is not about me talking at you. The goal here is to have a conversation with everybody here and share ideas um, and to make it as open a discussion as possible. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, I'm relying on everybody here to uh, kind of suggest ideas and come on video if they're willing to, um, or share ideas and questions in the chat, um, and try and kind of create an open dialogue about this. Um, so if you have a question or topic you'd like to see discussed um, or see others discuss, if you just have a question, you don't have to have an answer, uh, please use the Ask a, a Question button located at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also type it into the chat. Um, if you have something to say and would like to do so via video, we'd love to bring you up so that we can kind of have more of a uh, conversation uh, together. Um, and importantly, it's okay if you just have a question. This this is not about answering um, all the questions, especially given the size of this topic. It's more about kind of identifying what are the things that people are wondering about, about this idea of how do we think about the brain as a very complex system that maybe it has a kind of a low dimensional features be it in terms of like the governing rules or in terms of ways that we can describe its structure and function. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of give an overview of what I mean by um, kind of low dimensional uh, representations. And so um, if we're talking about space in the brain, we might talk about gradients, um, functional connectivity gradients, which are continuously varying or parcels and and uh, functional connectivity networks or ICA components. If we're talking about dynamics, we might talk about attractors or manifolds or metastates in terms of how the brain switches from one from one um, state to another or clustering uh, brain activity and functional connectivity states together. These are all ways to take very high dimensional complicated uh, things and represent them at a, at a more tractable level. And we're humans and we don't we're not good at trying to think in you know more than three dimensions, and so trying to reduce uh, the complexity of the brain and behavior is something that we as scientists kind of or want to do, just because otherwise it's kind of an intractable problem. Um, and this is not just true for for the brain, but it's equally true for the way we think about behavior and cognition. We can think about what do we mean by psychological processes? What are the fundamental processes and computations that happen in the brain? So we can think about things like the cognitive atlas, which try and create a con an ontology of uh, psychological processes and cognitive concepts, or things like RDOC or HITOP, which try and break down um, psychopathology into different type of in, into different like low dimensional constructs. Um, and so I'd like to just kind of open it up uh, and uh, see if people have. Thoughts about this? There, I created um, a Etherpad um, document uh, yesterday and kind of gave people the opportunities to share questions. And we had one person so far who suggested an idea. And so, um, Savannah, if you're willing to um, hop on uh, and kind of bring up what you kind of start the conversation by asking the question that you had, um, Katie, can you bring Savannah Cookson on? I'm on it. She has been invited. Yeah, so, so Savannah had had a, a question that I think would be kind of a good way to start us off. And please, if you if you have ideas about anything that comes up, like put it in the chat, ask, put, click the ask a question feature, or kind of even better, offer to come and chat on, on video, because that's going to be a lot more engaging. And this is something that works a lot better when we're all in the same room, but I wanted to try and do it um, <laughs> this year, even though um, it, it's a little bit trickier, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I guess popcorn for me. Um, yeah, so um, on the sheet, I, I am totally new to the concept of like gradients at a whole brain level. Um, I look at Rostropodal frontal axis organization. Um, 
across regions, which do tend to show like some sort of gradient effect to them. Um, but as someone new to the whole brain level of this, like my question was just sort of like, what can whole brain gradients tell us about uh, not just brain function, but cognitive function? Um, and how do we how do we go from this sort of exploratory stuff that I've been seeing to something more akin to the sort of experimental hypothesis driven work that is more uh, cognitive uh, focus? All right. I mean, so I think that that's that's kind of one of the questions that kind of motivated this session for me is I've had a lot of people. So I have a poster which includes gradient methods, which I think a lot of people do this year. And uh, a lot of the questions that I've had, I think for for every person who comes to my who has come to my poster who is familiar with gradients, I get a person who says, "What, what even is a gradient? Um, and uh, what what do we mean by it? And what counts as a gradient? And what do we learn from it?" Um, and I'm I'm you know I'm a graph theory functional connectivity person. I'm not necessarily a gradients person. So I think that. Um, e one one thing that kind of I think is a good place to start is what do we mean when we talk about gradients? Right? Well, how are we using the term gradient? Where I think that it is multiply defined um, as right. we have applied it in the literature, so it gets hard to have cross literature discussions when you're not quite sure you're talking about the same thing. <laughs> right. I mean, so so I've seen. Yeah. So here, so so, so here's this is this is a, this is a great great starting part. So 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 Kim is asking. So Dan, it seems like your overview only included fMRI examples. Can structural information inform gradient definitions? And I think that that's that's kind of very key to this question. So I just happened to include functional stuff because in the past, you know, half an hour when I was putting together the slides, those were the ones that I happened to have uh, most available. But yeah, so I think that there's a lot of kind of a lot of the most exciting work on gradients these days. Um, like exactly like the Pacola paper that was just cited in chat, um, are looking at structural gradients. And so things like uh, depth dependent myelination and looking at that uh, as a gradient and seeing how that um, matches with other types of uh, gradients or hierarchies in the brain. And I think that that's, that's some of the most exciting stuff. A lot There's been a lot of good work on like gene expression gradients. And so in terms of, in terms of like, what do we mean by gradients? There is, there's, there's kind of two, two kind of broad ways that I've seen it discussed. One is that it is a low dimensional representation, and by that I mean it's like an embedding. If you you take some high dimensional data and you find a low dimensional embedding and some low dimensional axis of variation for, of this high dimensional data, and then you look at how that relates to other things. Um, but I've similarly seen gradients discussed as things that are inherently low dimensional. So cortical thickness or T1, T2 uh, MRI, where there is a gradient um, in so far as like there is a continually, continually varying values, right? And it changes and it's, it's a gradient. Like if you think about a color gradient, that's a gradient. Um, and, and I think one thing that is, uh, is interesting when I've been thinking about this is that though they are one dimensional in our measures, the idea of a gradient is that there are a multiplicity of things contributing to it, right? So cortical thickness is not determined by one thing, even though we use a single measure. And so one, one thing that I think gradients can potentially do is help us break down these kind of things that are, that seem to be a single feature, but are really the result of many other things. Um, and so Kristen says, it, you know, it seems like in order to relate gradients to experimentation or hypothesis-driven work, we need to relate the gradients themselves to actual variability and connectivity, behavioral and microstructural properties, rather than the spatial trends of gradients themselves. Kristen, would you mind hopping on to talk a little bit more about that? I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah, and while you're setting that up, um, an interesting thought that just occurred to me is um, we've done this sort of low dimensional embedding setup, and we've got this factor that essentially kind of describes variability across the brain at a low dimensional level. And then we have all these other variables that do also vary across the brain. I wonder if somebody could set up like a, like a latent factor analysis to look at how all of those anatomical and functional spatial variables 
ability measures load on to these low dimensional factors and how they relate to each other. That, that would be an interesting way to try to get at how much of the variance of a gradient is explained by all these different factors. I have no yeah. idea how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Christian, would you be willing to come on video and just talk a little bit more about the, the idea of like relating variability to different things? Yeah, awesome. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. How's it going? Um, yeah, so I think I, I mentioned this briefly when I was in your, your poster chat room, but it seems like uh, if we're looking at single cortical regions and we compute a, like a, some sort of spatial gradient in those regions from either uh, microstructural properties or tractography or something like that, we get this sort of this sort of scale-free representation of the way in which those features vary spatially in that region. But it doesn't necessarily tell us how uh, variable those features are. Like, uh, or like if, we, if we're looking at, let's say, like if we're trying to compare like a disease model to healthy controls, um, can we sort of identify areas in the gradient, uh, so spatial areas in the gradient that sort of change due to deterioration of the function or the functional or structural connectivity profiles or mic microstructural profiles? Um, we need to be able to identify how those features are changing um, in order to relate those to changes in the spatial maps. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, so not so you're saying not just that the overall axis changes or the degree of, of variation along the axis changes, but like that within a region, like exactly. what, what is what is the variation within that, like mm -hmm. over time yeah. or over individuals? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really interesting point, and kind of getting to what. To what Savannah was saying is like, how do we how do we take these low dimensional representations and try and map them to each other, right? So we have networks and we have parcels and we have gradients and we have uh, we have you know brain areas defined in various different ways and trying to come up with a kind of parsimonious understanding of how they fit together, I think, is something that uh, is is difficult and uh, in so far as like technically, but I think the kind of intuitively it makes a lot of things. I think one of the reasons that gradients are kind of popular, um, at least in terms of the, the the stuff that I've been seeing, is that they they map to types of organization that we've seen already. Mm -hmm. right? They map to some someone shared the the Mesolum 1998 paper, the the from, from sensation to cognition, which is my by far my favorite paper ever. Um, in terms of like how do we understand how the brain is organized? And I think that that's a lot of the reason why I've seen people a lot of the paper, a lot of the papers I've seen, I think, are exciting because they show that that's the way the brain is organized. Um, mm -hmm. I think that John makes a really good point, which if I would love for him to 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 bring up um, and discuss, if if he's willing to join um, in, in on this chat, um, which is a really fundamental issue, which which I wanted, I was hoping someone would bring up, um, which is kind of distinguishing the methodology from the reality, um, and and. Kind of whether the brain uh, it is actually kind of governed by these low dimensional um, features or whether it is just a descriptive of it, a description of it. Yeah, so if we could bring John on. I would love to, but one of you needs to leave okay. first. Oh. There can only be four. I could walk off. Okay. Um, I how do you? Right <laughs> I can pick you off. Okay, sure. I have that power. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> John. Also, I'm going to take this dead time, not dead time, but dead air to say um, that I spent the last however many minutes, 15 minutes, looking for this talk that I saw. I guess my face could be up here too. Um, looking for this talk that I saw at the Brain Initiative Investigators meeting last year, and it was super cool, and I'm going to post the link. Um, it was a long time ago, and I don't remember the finer points, but it had a very delightful and intelligent discussion of dimensionality in the brain. And I think that if you're interested in this topic, you will be interested in this lecture. Um, oh, no. Okay. I'll let you get on with it. Okay. okay you want to go ahead, John? Well, I'll, I'll repeat the point. I like yeah. it's it, it, I know it sounds kind of moany, right? No, that's what I'm kind of like yeah. define things and uh, try to be precise and, and things like that. But um, uh, you know, I, th I think I think Daniel would be prepared to admit that the kind of choice of gradients is like a certain kind of strategic thing that they, you know, have opted for in in describing this work because it 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 serves a kind of descriptive purpose, but it is served a descriptive purpose at the level of the um, 
the the patterns, not the methodology, right? And my kind of, you know, so the point I was really making there is that this stuff has moved really quickly over the last few years, right? It's been like, boom, massive. Lots of cool work, lots of cool tools. Um, a certain part of that, I don't want to put a number on it, but a certain part of that has had a kind of characteristic of like, uh, anything you do a, a Laplacian eigen map on is a, is a gradient, right? By definition, because that's the methodology to give you a gradient. And that doesn't, ju that just seems like it's gonna break down. I mean, there's 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 good questions there about like where, um, what are we kind of learning about what the structure of those low dimensional representations are when you put the, when you kind of paint them on the surface of the cortex. But um, it's not, yeah, like a, a, a low dimensional representation is not guaranteed that you can, you do a Laplacian eigen map, you're going to get even smoothly varying stuff when you put it on the brain, right? Um, the fact that it is smoothly varying is, is interesting. Um, so I, 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 just a final point on that, I guess, is that that kind of, it becomes more of a question when, you, when you're doing these, these cross-modality comparisons. So again, like in terms of just a, the, the types of, the, there's, there's lots of stuff going on, lots of, lots of kind of integrative work, manifold, uh, gradients in T1, T2, gradients in gene expression, gradients in like X, Y, Z. Um, but the, the, these are kind of different quantities, right? And, and some of them are coming from low dimensional representations of high dimensional data. Some of them are coming from something that results from something structurally and you know, um, uh, ontogenically different, um, and I would I would urge some kind of clarity and you know distinctions to be made there, and and not for kind of that us to be in a situation in say two three years where the kind of uh, um, like working sec second synonymous term for uh, an eigenvector of a connectivity matrix is a gradient, because that that seems like it would take you to places where we've got really messy terminology fairly quickly. Yeah, following on that, um, it's interesting that the Mesalon paper comes up because um, I'm also very much interested in sort of like how these different levels of organization stack onto each other. And I would raise the question of, are gradients in that same stack as things like regions and networks, which are like neuroanatomical-ish features of the brain where these gradients are more like mathematical features of maybe maybe the neuroanatomical features but also maybe sort of the the physiological features that are driving the neuroanatomical organization um because i think those things sort of exist in parallel but they inform each other not necessarily that they all stack on top of each other yeah i mean i think that this is this is kind of the fundamental question that I think interests me about this, which is getting to uh, the, this distinction between like, what are we actually looking at, right? And I think a lot of the questions in the chat are like, is it inevitability that if we, like if you if you have noise and you do k-means clustering, you're gonna get clusters, right? If it, and I think as John said, it's, it's, it is interesting that, it, you know, we're not guaranteed that given a, the whole brain functional connectivity matrix, we're going to get something that's smoothly varying. But for instance, I was talking to Rogers uh, at my poster last night and I, well, you know, I just, we were talking about like, what is a gradient? And I kind of said, well, I feel like in the published literature, a gradient is a low dimensional embedding that happens to co-vary along with something else that you're interested in, which is, kind of how it's being used now, whereas I think that from kind of a mechanistic point of view, when I think about gradients, I think about development. I think about like a, there is a concentration gradient of some signaling, of so, you know, of some cellular signaling chemical that determines the degree to which, you know, uh, progenitor cells migrate to different layers of cortex. That's that's a gradient that, that we know kind of is physical and exists and manifests within the brain. And it would be it, it would be really good to try and see like to what extent do uh, the the kind of gradients that we're identifying through uh, these these kind of eigen eigen decomposition methods to uh, do they map to these things that we know are kind of mechanistically variant. 
the gradients. And I think that kind of to the to the point of like, is it just anything that's smoothly varying? I think that one one way to pin it, and this kind of gets back to the idea of like, well, it, it's anything that matches my expectations is, well, so cortical thickness gradients. Uh, there's some great uh, work from Conrad Wagstill that shows like cortical thickness follows hierarchies of uh, kind of information processing within visual cortex and, and auditory cortex and, and uh, motor networks. And that's, that's, that's cool because it shows that we are following, we are, we kind of, we're following this organization, but um, this kind of it, it is, are we learning things from that or is it just that we're doing descriptive and I'm, I'm not, I'm not kind of, Trying to put down descriptive science, all of the majority, vast majority of my science is descriptive science. But how do we move beyond that? Um, I, I think Janine had a really um, good point, and I, I was wondering if she'd be willing to to kind of come up and speak a little bit more to to this idea of um, we how can we learn about the system that we're that we're we're studying if we can understand the relationships between these flip and low, low dimensional representations. Alrighty, who wants to leave? I can pop off. I've been on forever. <laughs> okay, goodbye, Savannah. And we are pulling up. Uh, I'll add another quick point um, to follow on something you mentioned just now, Dan, which is, you know, um, something, okay, so smoothly varying is not good, it's not enough of a, of a criterion, right? Because um, Especially if we're talking, we're talking about neuroimaging data. I mean, neuroimaging data is smoothly varied. It it it, it it's always spatially autocorrelated. So, you've got any kind of statistical data structure that is has some minimal level of spatial autocorrelation, and you do this methodology, how do you of um, can, you know taking these um, these eigenvectors, then you're going to get like you're going to get spatially smoothly varying factors in the first few eigenvectors. It's like almost statistically. You could probably prove a theorem about this with some very minimal assumptions about spatial autocorrelation. So the interesting thing about um, about you know Daniel's work was that the, the gradient was actually it was it was tracking this this progression from one defined part of the cortex to another defined part of the cortex, right? So it had like an idea of where's this line that I, I want to travel through, I want I want to see var varying across that. So that was like an extra criterion on top of that. Um, so I think smoothly varying per se is is a bit thin, um, and on. But in addition, you know, um, things like trends up um, cortical hierarchies. Uh, that's not surprising to see, right? So uh, this, is a, especially if you're talking about kind of anterior, antero, um, posterior, um, and and ventro ventro dorsal. So. I think there's a question around like null models here is like what's what's a strong hypothesis about a smoothly varying um, pattern that you want to say is more than just what you can potentially expect to see from doing some analysis on some noisy data. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I think that kind of in terms of like how do we how do we look at how it's, it's related to other things. I think Janine has a really good point. Thank you. Um, this is a great session. I'm really excited about uh, this discussion. Um, one of the things, I mean, it seems like what we do is either clustering or some sort of icon decomposition. And that's pretty much everything that our field is all about. Um, and I think all of us have shown in really nice work that you can summarize the brain in really wonderful and interesting ways if you do either clustering or I could deposition in some form. But what I've started to think about is maybe, you know, obviously the brain is very high dimensional um, and we, we, we're using these dim low dimensional representations to kind of make sense of it. Maybe we could actually learn more about the brain if we had some way of actually understanding the relationship between when we do clustering and when we do eigen decomposition. You know, maybe if we could understand how different features of the underlying system would be represented differently, depending on the methodology that we would choose, maybe we would gain further insight into the complex system that we're studying. Yeah, and I, I think that that's that's something that I've been thinking about. And I think that a lot of this work does right. So most of the gradients papers that I see will will take a gradient and then compare it to things that are clusters. Essentially, they'll say, "How does it relate to 
the you know Thomas's 2011 networks? How does it relate to this parcellation based on different mi microstructural features? Um, and there is, I think that it's we're seeing a lot of that, and a lot of these gradients are kind of interesting because they relate to these things that we have established as meaningful, right? For various reasons, we think that laminar differentiation is meaningful because it's a it's a way to kind of distinguish what a, like the different types of cortical areas. We think that. Um, Functional networks are meaningful because they relate to behavior and that they show differences in individual differences in, in health and disease. Um, but I think that it, this kind of gets to it a more deeply underlying question, which is like, when we're looking at this, we're like, I think that's a really good point that you, like everything we do is like an agony composition or a clustering, right? And it's just, they're different, they're just different ways to look to describe the data at this low dimensional level because we, maybe that's all we can do. And I think Meng Sen had a really good question, which is like, to what extent do low dimensional dynamics or, or, or low dimensional spatial covariance, like simply reflect our wishful thinking, because that's all the tools and brains we've got to probe the brain. And I think that that's, that's kind of a critical question, right? So to what extent is the brain actually, you know, much more fundamental? And I think that makes sense also had, had or, or someone had a point about it in terms of like, what are the um, the idea that like of pattern formation and biological development, like that there may be a number of relatively simple rules, and you see this often in complex systems that create these much more compl complex emergent phenomena. And I feel like a, certainly for me, that's one of the interesting things about these low dimensional methods is that maybe we can identify like, what are those fundamental rules? What are those governing equations? But I don't know that the methods we're using right now are getting at that. But because the question, I, I completely agree with you that that would be what we would love to find out. But in a way, by choosing the method that we're choosing to reach the low dimensional representation, we're kind of putting bounds on what that might look like. You know, when we're when it's a cluster, then we're looking for hard boundaries, whether when it's a, an eigen decomposition of some sort, we're looking at something that might that has the potential to be smoother. And have we learned anything by doing that? It, it comes back to what several people have, have pointed out, you know, um, how do we find these, these fundamental rules or, or organizational principles without putting constraints on them in the first place? I don't think we can. And so therefore, can we learn more by looking at the relationships between them? Um, uh -huh. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. Um, so Elizabeth had, had a really interesting point um, about uh, where it was, I'm kind of following the, the, the chat in terms of like reliability of gradients. And this is something that I've been work, focusing on in my work recently. Um, Elizabeth, would you be willing to come in and come up and talk about like generalizability, the extent to which we can see things in, in single subjects? I will try her, which of you would like to leave? I can go. All right, all right, bye. Elizabeth has been invited. And while we're waiting, is there a link to slides or something that you'd like me to share? Um, so I just had those introductory slides. So I think that the, 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 the record of this chat and like there's a lot of really great things in the chat and that's kind of what I was expecting so um, people who are watching this um, later definitely keep an eye on the chat and not just what we're saying here um, I think it's things that if we were in person everybody would be would be saying and hearing each other say but um, yeah so we've got Elizabeth now so I think that's I think your, your point is, is important yeah sorry sorry I was trying to figure out webcams that's okay. um, but yes, no, no, no. So I think I, I've sort of followed this from a bit of a distance in terms of gradients. Uh, I'm much more familiar with like the clustering literature. Um, and I'm really interested personally in the, the functional alignment literature, which I think overlaps slightly with, with the question I have about gradients, which is that when I'm considering these different representations across individuals, to what extent uh, do they, they generalize? 
So like if I define gradients in one sample, do those gradients look the same when I then define them in another sample, which is matched on properties of expect like demographics? Um, because I think without that notion of, of or some notion of like generalizability, it, it is very much just descriptive for the particular sample it was derived in. Um, and I would just interpret it differently. Yeah, I think that's a really, I mean, I think that hopefully we all agree that kind of reliability and repl replicability is important in all of our work. But I, I think that is something that I've seen less of and partially because it's a relatively new field in terms of the gradients and uh, manifolds and things like that and i do i do want to get to like descriptions of dynamics I I in a little bit um because I, that's something that I, I that's a lot of what my work does but uh and, uh, kind of another point related to the re reliability is the extent to which you can actually identify these things in individual subjects um and not just the extent to which you can identify for instance a gradient or a clustering in individual subjects but the extent to which you can find a relationship uh between that whatever low dimensional representation you have, be it a parcellation or a clustering and some other feature of interest. Um, I, I think a lot of the work that we've seen takes a group average functional connectivity matrix or a group average, you know, uh, or, uh, kind of depth of like depth dependent myelin um, profile from, from T2 MRI and takes that and create and find something interesting. But for those of us who are interested in individual differences, it's important one that these measures are reliable from from t test to retest because if they're not then there's not a whole lot that we can get from them um and there's different there's a there's different questions in terms of reliability of for a particular region what is the what is the cluster assignment or what is the what is the kind of the gradient value and also like what is the overall pattern and there may be situations in which for an individual region it's not very reliable but the overall pattern is more reliable and so there's been work looking at kind of differences in autism gradients and looking at the overall kind of the 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 spread of the gradients um but i, I think that's that's really important work because if we if we want to try and use these methods to study individual differences, which I think is what a lot of us got into this to do so try and understand humans right humans are interesting because they're different and I think that's why a lot of us are in this field. And to do that, we need to be able to determine what are the factors that influence how reliably we can reconstruct a, a low dimensional manifold of dynamics, how reliably we can reconstruct these things in addition to the more fundamental questions of like, what are they actually telling us? If they're not reliable, if they're not identifiable in individuals, then how useful are they? I mean, to a certain extent, yes, like, okay, so it's great that we know that the brain is organized from an essentially fugal access, but we kind of knew that already um and if we can tell that like the great principal gradient of gene expression follows that that's that's awesome um but then trying to look as we move and we get our better methods how do we try and move towards looking at individual differences is really important yeah absolutely and i, I would just like to say one thing um that i've seen just sort of in in my own work uh, because what we're thinking about is sort of like the hyper alignment literature, right? Where you, you think about how do you align these uh, response or connectivity patterns. And I, I know Feilong Maas does some really good work in terms of thinking about then how does that relate to inter-individual differences sort of along this, this line. But when you talk about alignment um, and you talk about these sorts of issues, you get very quickly into the murky area of what is similarity. Um, how do you define similarity? How do you measure similarity? You know, how do you say two things are more or less similar? Um, it's not an easy question in the same way that clustering is not an easy question, right? It's, it's a very, uh, it's a fraught sort of uh, well-researched area. And so I, I think there's going to be a lot of um, interesting work that could happen in that area just to say, what do we really mean when we're, we're trying to relate these things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I think the, the question of individual differences is a really important one. And it comes back to the session that we had beforehand about confounders and, and alignment. People differ in so many ways and which ways are interesting and important and which ways interrelate with one another, I think is really important to make sense of the of our data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about space and I'd spend, like to spend a little bit of talking about time and uh, Vince, feel free to say no, but since I see you're here, could I ask you to come on and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of ask you, I think you and your lab has used pretty much every method there is to try and decompose 
uh, both space and time, but especially trying to look at dynamic, like functional connectivity dynamics and activity dynamics. And I would love to hear from you how you think about these methods that you use in terms of identifying states um, and, and like the extent to which like does, is the brain a state machine? Does it go from one state to another to another? Probably not. Can we describe it that way? Is that meaningful? I think that these are questions that we've talked about a lot in the past, but it, I think this would be a good way to jump into the idea of like how do we represent dynamics in a low dimensional way? And to what extent are dynamics like accurately described in a low dimensional way? Um, so if it's is willing to come on, if not, that's totally fine. And I'm kind of putting them on the spot, but- um, I was gonna say, should I jump off? Yeah. I'm was happy to, to yeah. I'm happy to jump off too. Would you like to, or are you just happy? To? <laughs> okay. I'll go, and then we can we can have these as independent decisions. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All righty. And invited. Okay, so um, while we're waiting for um, Vince, I think that something that would be kind of interesting to talk about if, if anybody has thoughts is the idea of using computational models or generative models to try and think about how do we try and break down, how do, can we try and identify the things that are creating these low dimensional representations? And if we can do that, is that maybe a way to identify the extent to which these are like actually, what are the biological parameters which are shaping them? So I'm gonna I'm gonna let Vince kind of go and with the prompt of like, we we break the brain down into these pieces. How real are these pieces? And is there there's a utility in them even if they're not real, right? There's a utility for biomarkers. There's a utility for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But I'd really really interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think you kind of pegged it right there, which is the way I think about it is that. Um, we've got this really complex data and we know that things are varying in time and we need models and representations that can allow that variation to occur in order to observe what's going on, right? And so, um, you know, the, the, just to kind of <clears throat> use the work we did uh, as an example, you know, we started with, uh, you know, time varying connectivity sort of, you know, set basically clustering into states and then we, then we move to overlapping and continuous, and and, and now we're looking at um, you know um, you know sort of uh, more continuous type uh, representations. Um, I wish I knew the answer. I don't know the answer, and um, I view each approach as kind of a different window, right, in, into what's going on, and. I hope, you know, so I kind of liked your idea of th thinking about low dimensional representations, uh, which is there's a ton of them, right? The, and, and, and they're all useful in certain contexts and maybe they should be all put together and we should kind of try to figure out how they relate to one another, how they compare. And ultimately we want to use, um, use them to figure out what's going on and propose some models for how the brain actually works, right? And so I'm not gonna step into that <laughs> uh, in, in this discussion, but, um, but I do think it's really important to keep thinking about what are we using right now and what are the limitations in what we're using right now and, and how can we relax that and just evaluate whether we're missing something. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I think about things all the time. And over the years, almost always we find we're missing things, right? And so, we, you know, and then we try to kind of explore in these different directions. And so, I, I don't know that, if that's helpful, but that's kind of how I, I think about it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I, do you have a sense of like, what do, what do you feel we're missing right now? Or, or what are things that you're kind of interested in trying to figure out in terms of what are we missing? Um, so, you know, we're still, we're still pushing pretty hard in, in terms of um, uh, dynamics, right? And, um, uh, not only that, but um, multimodal links, right? So, so how do, what's the interaction between, you know, a, a structural sort of think about it as a prior or a substrate and, and then the functional dynamics and how does that inter interact differently in different individuals? Um, and then, um, you know, we're also, I know there's been a lot of discussion about, well, how useful is it to go to nonlinear relationships and things like that? Um, you know, 
deep learning approaches do they you know do they help you or do they just add more parameters and um, you know mess things up or give you something to say but aren't really <laughs> that useful and you know I you know we're seeing evidence that um, in in some cases you know th these these models are useful are really useful not only um, in things like prediction but also in um, uh, helping us to uh, find these links, right, between modalities, which are really complex. Um, and so uh, we're, we're kind of pushing there. Um, another area that I mentioned in, um, I think, our machine learning replicability session a few days ago, or I don't know what day it is now, but um, uh, is that, um, you know, what I, I see this kind of cycle where you, you know, somebody finds something really interesting and it's kind of a low dimensional relationship and then uh, and then once you kind of see that it's useful and you understand it a little bit you, you add dimensions to it right and you, and you get more and more complex but it's useful because you kind of understand where you're starting from so think about like resting fmri right we started with 10 you know three five ten you know 20 now we're at 100 200 a thousand you know uh you know networks and it, it's also true of we're looking at um in terms of, we're still doing modeling of you know sort of clusters slash states right as as dynamics, but when you push up higher uh, into higher dimensions, you find that you get subsets of states that are uh, replicable and predictive, and others that are not. And so you kind of have this sort of larger feature space that you can you can select from in in this sort of uh, training testing framework, and so that can be useful. So there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, so, yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Did you have something, Janine? I was gonna, I, I like that summary even. Um, I was gonna say, what do you think we learn more when we go from like three or 10 to like a thousand, either in the, the, the kind of spatial domain or in the state domain? Do you, do you think we're, do you think it's really adding a more fine grade understanding or? Hmm. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, don't I mean, know. so I, I'm sure it doesn't always. But um, in, in, in to give an example, uh, the work that um, uh, Armin Iraji is doing in, in in my group, looking at spatial um, dynamics, right? And so there, you have to have a spatial pattern, which is essentially higher dimensional representation, um, and we see these sort of blending and merging of networks and patterns of networks and, and they're not just fixed networks that are weighted the shapes of the networks are you know are changing in what look like meaningful ways and and they're also very different when you look across individuals you look across disorders um to to, to link it to one one uh bit of work so i guess randy i think randy buckner has done some work looking at um individual subject um, uh, unique patterns, right, within like default mode network and the like. Well, if, if you analyze data across a group using a spatially flexible approach, you see those things at the group level too, right? And so it, it's, it's really kind of bringing together those two things um, in, in that case. And so, um, you know, so that doesn't mean that everything that, you know, it, it you have to figure out where, where they're going to be useful and, and, and focus on a particular place because things explode really, really quickly. But there we, we, we do see a lot of uh, benefits of, of going higher. So I, that's a nice example. But that and that's more moving from static to um, dynamic representations, mm -hmm. which I, I can imagine adds a lot of additional information over and above just a hierarchical structure. Right, right. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Vin and Janine so much for, for hopping on. I'm going to, in our last 10 minutes, I want to invite uh, Mengsen and, and Randy up if they're willing to talk about modeling and the role it plays here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, kind of just as a starting point, I think Mengsen had a really interesting point in terms of like states or things like that, that you can have a continuously varying function that at some point has a phase change, right? Where you get this fundamental difference in dynamics from just changing a single parameter. And so I think that kind of maybe looking at, at models can 
give us an idea of where we get that. So yeah, if, if, if you guys would be willing to jump on, that would be great. Absolutely, thanks. Will, will somebody kick me off or do I have to push some button to get off? I think Katie I can will kick you off. Okay. Some, some great joys in life. Bye, thank you. Thank you guys. All right. I guess small joys in life is more accurate. Yeah. And I, I I really like the the idea that the, the idea that Megson had in terms of like that they, that you do get these kind of these these phase changes where you get a like a, a qualitative change in, in in the behavior of a system, um, and it's not necessarily continuous. And maybe maybe that is one way in which we can kind of look at the kind of low the low dimensions of dynamics. Um, and maybe that's what we're seeing when we're looking at at kind of these states. Hey, Randy. Hello. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to let you guys guys go ahead, um, but you guys both have really really interesting thoughts on modeling. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of what we talked about in the session thus far is really focused on things we can measure empirically, and um, whether we talk about um, structural MRI, DTI, um, functional metrics, and so on. Um, the challenge, of course, we don't know what's what are the important features that allow these different aspects of the brain to, to link up to enable things like cognitive function. And that's really where I think um, some of the simulation work that I've been doing and other people have been doing really can help because it does allow you to sort of decide amongst these features which are the important ones that enable things like uh, you know, gradients or manifolds to emerge from these data sets and which ones are not relevant. So, for example, things like symmetry and heterogeneity and things of that sort. Um, they can be um, tested in simulations. You can do very simple simulations, like, for example, some of the work that Victor had done, Victor Yursa, many years ago, just looking at heterogeneity of connections by themselves, and getting nice uh, dynamics just by varying heterogeneity of uh, connectivity or gradients, if you will. Um, but more recently, of course, we've got the, the platform that we've been working on now for a while, Virtual Brain, where you can link in the empirical data and make decisions about what you think are the important features and then see if your simulation does in fact, uh, is it consistent with the data? So it's a nice way of sort of taking a complicated uh, array of empirical data you have and making some uh, informed theoretical decisions about how they actually interact and using the modeling platform to kind of push the whole thing forward. So it's an important feature that I, I'm starting to see up here in people's sort of thoughts of how they proceed, but it seems to be hard to think about how to do that until you realize that that's actually how you can bring all this stuff back together. Yeah. Uh, I want to like just add on that maybe two points. One is the idea of control parameter, as the people like us who do uh, uh, nonlinear simulations. Uh, one part is really to even just from I give you a, a model, not to say that's a brain with any measure. I give you a very complicated model. What are the parameters that actually are going to make an important effect on the behavior of the system? That is not trivial to find out given any very complicated systems. So. One thing is to really identify in modeling biological system in general, I think, is to not just find out the variations or, or gradients, is what, what kind of variations or gradients are actually going to make a qualitative difference in the patterning of the biological organism. This has been much more, I think, a study much more um, uh, maturely in the, uh, say, uh, animal development uh, process of you will have, you need to know where's the head, where's the tail for the animal, and you need a chemical gradients to guide the development of animals and plants. And this have a functional significance to the disrupt that you might have grow wrong stuff at the wrong places. Um, but not all uh, variations are going to cause this kind of qualitative difference, like you grow three hands. Uh, and so there, it's, there's a combination in the nonlinear I mean, it's interesting to say you have so much variability. You live in a noisy environment. Some parameters matter. Some parameter doesn't matter. It gives you both the control and the robustness in this situation. Um, so I th think instead of identifying what are the gradients, are, it's also important to identify what is the gradients that matters. And that's where you actually need um, uh, simulations and theoretical analysis with uh, Nonlinear dynamical models, and the reason of that is for nonlinear systems, uh, uh, it's not that straightforward. I can give you the law of the universe, and you wouldn't really be able to tell that much about what is going to happen from there. So I think that this is something 
uh, I, I talk to a lot of people that don't understand is, oh, I find the laws of the universe before I know anything. Oh, they go, no. If you go to see the mathematicians or they're struggling with these equations, you will know that given the equations, you are very far away from knowing what's going to happen. So I think a lot of effort from the theoretical side or modeling side of the, the community is really trying to find out what are the important variations in the brain that will make a difference and it's not going to be straightforward and there's a lot of computation and computerized experimentation. Um, and, and then you can go back again to the um, uh, data. So you can try to perturb the system again um, with um, uh, TMS or uh, TDCS, TACS to, to, to see if the perturbations of uh, which the, the ex ex expected effect um, from your model will actually be reflected in the brain. And that's that's another approach to this um, uh, low dimensional or, or gradient perspective. Yeah, I think that that's a really nice way of thinking about things. And as I was thinking about preparing for this discussion, I started thinking about like the standard model in physics, right? You've got this, you know, relatively small number of things which create all this complexity. And I think that there, it's interesting to think about, you know, this is the this is the human brain mapping meeting and there's mapping, right? So there's the question of how do we first map? And I think that a lot of the work we've done in terms of, you know, states and dynamics and gradients and clusters in space is trying to figure out what the map is. And then I think a more fundamental question for a lot of us is once we've identified the map, what are the things that created it, right? So it, if we're talking about the planet Earth, well, that's plate, tecton that's plate tectonics to, to a certain extent. And then there's also like geopolitics, which determines where are the boundaries. And then what are what are those things for the brain? Because I think those are the things that for certainly if we're trying to look at you know, one, just from an explanatory point of view, like what, what are the things that explain what we see? But then also from like a clinical and translational point of view, what are the things that we need to change? I think your point about like what are the things that matter uh, to, to create the phenomena that we see these we have this complex system that has these particular types of phenomena, which we can describe in low dimensional ways. What are the things that matter for that? I agree. Does that mean I, I put a, a link to a paper that just came out a while ago that, looked, that used um, uh, computational modeling based on some HCP data and we use sort of, a, uh, I forgot the name of the model. It's basically an oscillator, oscillatory model um, that looked at relating the dynamics of that model to, to intelligence. So, you know, whether that's reasonable or not, I don't know, but at least it's a good example of where you can use uh, the empirical data to drive a computational model. Um, Vince made some notes about the fact that modeling nonlinear systems is complicated and it's difficult and normally features this like, but that's actually part of the challenge, right? Uh, we can either ignore it, which we've been doing for the last 20 years, or try and figure out how to incorporate that in our model and find out exactly, as, as we've just been saying, which are the features that are quite important and be able to explain the relationship between these different scales that we're, we're looking at and the emerging cognitive functions out there, there, I think it's worthwhile trying to incorporate those approaches to see if we're making that, if our guesses are good guesses or not. I think I think this has been a really wonderful start of a conversation, and there are so many different issues. Um, so thank you so much, Vincent Mengsen, and everyone else who has come on. And just in the last minute or two, I want to kind of talk about okay, like where do we go from here? I think that. Uh, this is just a start. There are many, many issues. We could spend years, and we do spend years trying to ask these questions. We spend careers trying to ask these questions. And there seems to be a lot of interest in asking these questions together. And so what uh, what I'd like to do is uh, in the GitHub uh, comment for the that proposed this emergent session, I've put a link to a Google group that people can join if you're interested in continuing this conversation. I don't see any reason why we can't continue having these conversations maybe on particular topics as we go throughout the, for the foreseeable future when we're sitting in our homes, there's no reason we can't start talking to each other about this and identifying these questions. And I think that certainly it's as someone who's trying to get into this idea and learning this stuff, hearing what these experts have to say and hearing what other people who are new to this have to say is really useful. Um, and so um, please, yeah, please, consider like signing up for that and, and keeping in touch. And um, yeah, thank you all for joining so much.